We will involve ourselves in understanding historical texts. This will feature Ford's Model T, the first bicycle, and Robert Fulton's steamboat. You name it, we get to do it today. This is Literacy Corner. I'm Mr. McCoy, your guide. Here it all comes now. The Model T is our first focus, and as you work to understand this historical text, look for why people began to own cars in this era of American history. When the first cars were produced, only wealthy people could afford them. Henry Ford wanted to build a car that the average working person could afford. In 1908, the Ford Motor Company introduced a new low-cost car. It was called the Model T and sold for $825. Although the car was reasonably priced, Ford kept thinking of ways to make it even cheaper. He knew that the lower the price, the more customers he would gain and the more money he would make. Ford's early cars were all handcrafted. This meant that each of the automobiles was slightly different from the next. It also meant that each one took a long time to make. Ford decided his cars would no longer be handcrafted. They would be put together in exactly the same way, saving time and money. In 1913, Ford began producing cars with the help of a moving assembly line. The moving assembly line achieved Ford's goal of turning out a car faster and for increasingly lower prices. In time, Ford's factory was turning out one automobile every 90 minutes. By 1915, the Ford Motor Company was earning record profits, and by 1918, half of all cars in the United States were Model Ts. Almost overnight, the United States became a nation on wheels. So why were more and more people able to afford to buy a car? Share with your fellow listener. The bicycle's first century is our next focus, and as you strive to understand this historical text, listen for how each model of the bicycle improved upon the previous model. Two centuries ago, Bicycles did not look like the bikes you know today. Invented by a Frenchman around 1790, the first bicycle had two wheels and a wooden frame. It worked like a scooter. Then, in 1816, a German improved on this design. He connected a bar to the front wheel. This allowed the rider to steer the bicycle. Later, in 1839, a Scottish blacksmith made yet another improvement. He added foot pedals, which let riders put force on the wheels. Now, bicycles could move faster. In the 1870s, the high wheel bicycle appeared. It was called this because the front wheel was far larger than the rear wheel. The pedals turned the front wheel only, but the size of that wheel meant that each turn of the pedals took the rider over a greater distance than before. On the high wheel bicycle, the rider sat up high over the front wheel. Consequently, when the large front wheel struck a rock or a rut in the road, the rider could be pitched head first over the front of the bicycle. The high wheel bicycle wasn't very safe. In 1885, an Englishman made the first safety bicycle. The bicycle was now beginning to look more like the modern one that you see every day. Its front and rear wheels were the same size and sprockets and chains linked the pedals and the rear wheels. In the 1890s, inventors added air-filled rubber tires. Then came a coaster brake and adjustable handlebars. The first hundred years of the bicycle from 1790 to the 1890s brought many changes and the next century would bring even more improvements. So, over that first century, what improvements were made to the model of the bicycle, share with your fellow listener. Up next, from Fulton's success, and as you strive to understand this historical text, listen for how Robert Fulton came to invent the steamboat. Fulton's folly, people jeered as they passed Brown's shipyard in New York City. It was 1807. Brown's was the site where inventor Robert Fulton and his partner Robert R. Livingston Jr. were building a very strange boat. The two men knew that putting a steam engine on board a vessel was still new and dangerous. But they ignored the taunts. 
They were convinced that Fulton's steamboat ideas, combined with Livingston's financial backing, would revolutionize transportation in America. And they were right. On August 17, after devoting about five months to its construction, Fulton launched a vessel that measured 150 feet long, 13 feet wide, and nine feet deep. Fulton and a group of invited guests prepared to steam up the Hudson River from New York City to Albany. Albany is the state capital. The guests had to put up with primitive conditions. There were no cabins, no beds, and a roaring uncovered steam engine mounted in the center of the boat. There was also fear that the engine would explode. They cast off at 1 p.m. The vessel puffed away from the dock and stalled. The passengers' whispering turned into loud mumbles, which eventually gave ways to shouts of dismay. Sensing their fear, Fulton promised to return to the dock if he could not fix the problem. After a short time, there was a huge blast of smoke. Once again, the boat churned up river. It was described as looking like a giant tea kettle. The vessel's engine let off steam and rained down sparks that sizzled in the water. The noise was deafening, but the boat was moving. The passengers cheered. The boat chugged upstream against the tide at a fast four to five miles per hour. It easily passed sailing ships and fishing craft. In its wake, the boat's two side paddle wheels left waves of foamy water and lots of terrified onlookers. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. Darkness fell, but the boat continued its journey. With a full moon and warm breezes, the passengers stayed up all night singing songs by candlelight. They had mostly forgotten their fears. The next day, the boat docked at Livingston's estate called Clermont. After spending the night, it continued steaming to Albany the following morning. It pulled into that city at 5 p.m. on August 19. The boat had made the 150-mile trip in 32 hours of travel time. Crowds cheered its arrival. No longer a joke, Fulton's Folly had become the first successful steamboat in America. So how was it that Robert Fulton was able to achieve success in creating the steamboat? Share with your fellow listeners. This marks the end of today's edition of Literacy Corner. The next one will also be coming full steam ahead.